Good morning. Thank you, Edward, for the introduction. Thank you, Mari Carmen, for the invitation to be here and for the opportunity you have given me uh, of participating in this uh, very exciting uh, project, both in the formulation of the database and in the editing of the uh, second volume of the ICA, ICA document series. And I'd like to say before I begin that my rambling thoughts on the general issue of nationalism that we'll be discussing today uh, is pretty much based in the collective uh, work we have been developing over the past few years with my colleagues Karin Cordero and Victor Sorel, co-editors of the second volume with me. And I'd also like to say that I have no real pictures, so Maria McGregor, wanting to keep you awake with some images, has put together a PowerPoint with some documents. Well, my talk today will not focus on a particular artist, critical movement, as I actually usually prefer to do, but will attempt an extremely broad, even impressionistic, presentation of one of the crucial topics of 20th century artistic debates in Latin American art, and I would venture to say, even in a broader global art history. The issue is nationalism, a subject that has attracted the fervent attention of a number of scholars in the humanities and the social sciences, but which has, as yet, to generate as much interest in our historical studies. I will come to the reasons behind this relative neglect but before I do so, I would like to say that only a few years ago, I never would have conceived as broad an approach as I am attempting. My work as an art historian has always been very much focused on particular, specific issues. I have always believed that one must begin from the small fragments of history to build up a narrative that can take on uh, bigger themes and make some kind of contribution to art historical knowledge. If I now venture from a micro to a macro historical perspective, it is largely through the experience of having participated in the ICAA Documents of 20th Century Latin American and Latino Art Project. Through my Carmen Ramirez's invitation, I have been part of the editorial committee from the very beginning of this ambitious enterprise. Now I have also worked closely with the Peruvian team, which has been coordinated by the Museo Arte Lima with the participation of a number of established scholars in the field and an emerging generation of young researchers. Our team has worked from a local perspective, attempting to compile significant documents of Peruvian art history that could build a representative survey of the crucial debates defining 20th century art. The rest of the teams have followed a similar course, working within the framework of national art histories, and thus continuing what has been a major element in the historiography of art in the region. The nation is precisely the central subject at the heart of the second volume of the critical documents of 20th century Latin American Latino art series, the first volume of which we have now presented on occasion of the webpage launch. The anthology, which as I have mentioned, I have the pleasure of co-editing with my colleagues Karen Cordero and Victor Soren, brings together documents selected under the title national imaginaries, cosmopolitan identity. Rather, actually, and I always get confused, it is national identities, cosmopolitan imaginaries, or somehow. I actually am not sure anymore, but who cares? It's the same thing. Which corresponds to one of the 13 editorial categories used by the teams to classify the documents included in the database. I will attempt to be very generally describe our anthology and the problematics around which it is structured, and which affect doubly both the art produced in the 20th century and its history. What follows thus are a few isolated thoughts on the ways in which both the nation state and the discourses of nationalism have been determinant factors in the history of Latin American art of the 20th century, in its historiography, and also in the project that gathers us here in Houston today. We should start by acknowledging that by centering on the notion of a Latin American and Latino art as a broad subject, the ACAA project appears to transcend the national historiographies that have fueled the team's effort. 
This would seem to confirm that the field as such exists only from place without the region, which is now, has traditionally been, and appears to continue to be, the United States. Latin America is a necessary concept in the administrative structure of museums and in the organization of area studies in the academy, both of which are relevant to broader economic and political factors. Within Latin America, on the contrary, the structures that give support to the museum and the academy are very much cut off in the type web of the nation state and its discourses. Public expectations, economic sustenance of museums, and political interests of state institutions determining the national orientation of museum collections and academic studies. And I, of course, should add economic limitations to the list. In this context, it is important to consider that, to my knowledge, there is no single source of funding in Latin America to promote regional area studies or museum exchanges. So far, within Latin America, the region remains largely as an idea with no practical or institutional foundation. The ICA project thus largely replicates the situation. The Museum of Fine Arts Houston generated the project we are now launching, raised most of the funds to finance it, and determined the general criteria and selected partner institutions in Latin America. An editorial board of art historians and museum professionals from the US and Latin America have contributed to shaping the general framework of the project. National teams, supported locally and financed largely through the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, have worked in developing a selection of documents that refer to national historiographic traditions. Yet as, the, yet as the contributions of the different teams come to appear on the ICA website, those national histories will be partially diffused and disrupted by an interface that allows the researcher to access those documents by a number of other points of entry. Beyond a simple keyword search, a user can browse documents by category, author, title, topic, or geographic descriptors. The database archive thus somehow erases the traces of the teams that built its contents, and thus effectively eliminates the nation as a main framework of analysis. But is this the case, and if so, what remains? The edited volumes in the ICA project are a good test of the productive tension between micro and macro histories that frames the broader project of which they are a part. So I will now turn more precisely to our anthology of national imaginaries, imaginaries and cosmopolitan identities, as I am an author of an anthology, that I, and I don't even know the title of it. So let's go on. The anthology is structured by two terms, national and cosmopolitan that shape a dichotomy that has defined, in one way or another, most of the important debates of the century. Perry Anderson has reminded us that internationalism is a term that depends, almost by definition, on its opposite, nationalism. Yet it carries with it none of the negative associations with which nationalism has traditionally been linked. Such negative associations have indeed not only been a part of 20th century artistic debates, but they have also defined even the historiography of Latin American art of that century. So perhaps an anecdote can allow us to understand the stakes. I remember a discussion in a session of the editorial board when I innocently asked the team coordinator why a number of immensely influential intellectual and critics of a nationalist aesthetics had been omitted from the team's selection of documents. I received a very clear and very despondent reply. It was explained to me that the ICAA project was dedicated to the study of the avant-gardes, and that the conservatism of the authors I had mentioned clearly contradicted the spirit of the undertaking. The subtext of the response was that only a seriously conservative art historian like myself could somehow venture to suggest that such texts were worthy of study. Yet there were other very interesting issues in this response, one of them was confusing an intellectual interest with a partisan position as if, in proposing the study of the text, I were at once also citing politically with the ideas it contained. The comment thus suggested that the ideas discussed in those historical texts were not dead, but alive and well, and that the issues were still very much a part of our ways of thinking. I'd like to propose that, in fact, the emergence over the past two decades of a revised canon of 20th century Latin American art also frames this attitude. 
as the art free region has asserted its place both in international museums and academic spaces, as well as in the marketplace, we have seen the gradual emergence of a new modernist canon. Where before the central figures of our surveys were Verni, Lam, Rosco, Rivera, or Siqueiros, Sabogal, or Portinari, perhaps, artists variously working in a figurative tradition which is perceived as aligned with nationalism and social realism. Today, these figures are accompanied, when not displaced, by other very different names. Carmel Orden Queen, Willis de Castro, Lucia Clark, Carlos Cruz Diaz, Elio Tisica, or Jesus Rafael Soto, for example. Among other artists associated with the rise of post-war abstraction. This would certainly be a welcome expansion to the list of internationally recognized Latin American artists, had it not turned into a new reductive and confining canon. What we now have as a, what we have now has marginalized other artistic idioms, even within abstraction. And lyrical abstraction is, in fact, one of the evident victims. And it has also obscured eccentric modernities, leaving the greater part of the region's artistic production by the wayside. At the same time, the establishment of a narrative of Latin American art built around modernist post-war abstraction has somehow revived the terms of the artistic debate which accompanied the emergence of the works themselves. Beverly Adams, Andrea Junta, and others have emphasized the internationalist impulse behind the introduction of modern art in the immediate post-war period, a moment when abstraction and artistic autonomy were pitted against figuration in a discursive web that confronted the defenders of modern art in a battle against nationalism, social realism, and politics. Figuration and nationalism were the declared enemies of emerging modernist artists of the late 30s and after. One of the foes of universalism, for example, was indigenous. In 1939, Cesar Moro mocked the indigenists who, and I quote, pretended to circumscribe today the essentially poetic and thus universal expression of pictorial art to norms that channel the spirit of modern man in Peru into that alley with no end and no seduction which is the arbitrary or fair reproduction of the Indian. His wife, mother-in-law, and the father-in-law of the Indian, or of the Indian son and all his family. And, and such attacks were directed at even assertive modernists, such as Joaquin Torres Garcia. In 1946, Tomás Maldonado could write, and I quote, against the dusty archaism of Torres Garcia, his penchant for indigenous pastiche, and his inability to feel the emotional sentiment of a white, washable surface painted in black. A decade later, José Luis Cuevas would pronounce himself against, and I quote, the vulgar, limited, provincially nationalist Mexico, fearful of the foreign to self security. Such various and diverse strands of largely apolitical modernisms and their embattled entry into the discourses of art seems to have been everywhere shaped by identical components and set in a similar field of oppositions. The very sense of urgency that marked these discussions radicalized stances on either side of the debate, generating extremes between positions that were perhaps not quite as distant, either aesthetically or politically. In fact, we could venture to say that both our present perception of 20th century art history and of the artis artistic debates of the first half of the century are tainted by the stringent oppositions that define post-war aesthetic disputes, and also by the new political framework of the Cold War, which brought new meaning to such terms as nationalism and internationalism. I want to suggest that the current aversion to the issue of nationalism somehow bases itself on the radicalization of oppositions that frame its debates. We have projected its view of things on 20th century art, now conceived as a field fraught in constant tension between between the extremes of nationalism and cosmopolitanism, tradition and modernity, the rear and the avant-garde. In a very different panorama emerges when we look at the actual discourses at play in the aesthetic debates of the early decades of the century. Nationalism was then not necessarily at odds with the avant-garde, either in literature or in the visual arts. One could argue, rather, that the opposite was the case. The Martin Fierro Manifesto, for example, proposed to, and I quote, accentuate and extend to other intellectual manifestations of the movement for independence begun in language by Ruben Darío, which does not mean, however, that we should renounce, or no less feign to disavow, that every morning we will make use of Swedish toothpaste, French towels, 
en el universo. Anco. José Carlos Mariátegui brought the pairing of nationalism and modernism to a programmatic level, writing on indigenism, which he described as, and I quote, encouraged by the elements of cosmopolitanism that have been assimilated into our literature. He pointed out to the interest of the American avant-garde in autonomous and local themes. In the new Argentine literature, he wrote, no one feels more native to Buenos Aires than Girondo or Borges, or more gaucho than Miralles. On the other hand, those who like La Reta remain in bondage to Spanish classicism are basically incapable, incapable of interpreting their countries. And it is useful to recall now the last sentence of Maria Tegui's chapter on literature in his seven interpretive essays of Proving Reality, and with a sentence that dissolves the rigidity of the dichotomy, stating, and I quote, that the universal ecumenical roads that we have chosen to travel and for which we are reproached take us ever closer to ourselves. End quote. If on the one hand universalism was not necessarily post-nationalism, then again, even in the arguments of the staunchest, most extreme defenders of the autonomy of art, one can find a dependence on the idea of a national art, even if it is only as a form of reaction against the concept. Among the selected documents in our anthology are a number of texts written in reaction against notions of heritage and geographic determination, such as the case of Manuel Mables Arce writing on the universalism of modern construction in his Estetica del Cielo Cemento of 1926, or Juan O'Gorman arguing against demands for national themes in the facades of Mexican schools. Such examples could be multiplied almost to no end. We could cite similar passages from texts on Brazilian or Cuban modernism, published in the long decade that begins in 1918 and then somewhere around 1932. And amidst the obvious differences, we can distinguish a certain <coughs> discursive uniformity that is as striking as a coupling of nationalism with the avant-garde. <coughs> there are, of course, variations and contending versions of national imaginaries that are forged in this period. It always seemed to be caught up in the thread of broader discurse, discourses that are shared across the region. In this regard, the anthology forces us to take a new look at regional divisions with which we have worked. According to common knowledge, and following Marta Trava's famous categories, the open nations of Latin America would be Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, while Bolivia, Ecuador, and Peru would lie among the closed areas. Our broad survey reports no such partition. Rather, we perceive changing relations between the different nations, which give shape to constantly fluctuating frontiers between cultural regions. There is, for example, site one among many possible places, a now forgotten but once vital corridor uniting Argentina, Bolivia, and Peru in the first third of the century. It was specifically the discourse of cultural nationalism promoted in the writings of Ricardo Rojas that first allowed intellectuals of the three countries and beyond to imagine a common project of national affirmation based on the revival of vernacular idioms. The intense exchange between figures like Martin Chambi, José Uriel García, Héctor Vélez Levy, Ángel Guido, Martín Noel, José Sabogal, or Luis Evalcarce, among many, many others, is confirmed by the very circulation of intellectuals and artists in the region, as well as of their writings and diaries and journals of Buenos Aires, dailies and journals of Buenos Aires, Cusco, La Paz, or Lima. Now, despite this intense history of shared intellectual debates, in the historiographic imagination, Bolivia and Peru do not belong in the same group with Argentina. This is largely because the current image of the history of 20th century Argentinian art is largely centered around the reconstruction of concrete art movements and aligned with the geometric and constructive utopias dominant in post-war Brazil and Venezuela. The way we think of our geographies is thus largely the product of changing historiographies and the borders and groupings, as Terry Smith has reminded us yesterday, can productively change when we assume a different position or perspective. So the general histories, and I emphasize the plural, that we can begin to construct of the, of the 20th century on the basis of this database project can be immense, immensely productive. What the anthology we are now editing allows us to do is precisely to follow the course of a general history that is usually lost to us in prevailing monographic formats. The anthology allows us to trace the way in which art was given a central place in the construction of national imaginaries almost simultaneously across the region at the end of the 19th century. 
and how it was uniformly displaced from this central position as a design defining element of artistic debate after the Second World War. It is interesting that this broad development coincides with the general terms of most histories of nationalism, such as Eric Cosby Hobsbawm's classic narrative described in Nations and Nationalism since 1780. For example, even though our anthology traces the origins of nationalist aesthetic discussions to the 19th century, it does not include a single document of the independence period, for example. The early revolutions were, in fact, defined as a quest for political self-definition and economic autonomy. Claims to cultural difference and originality were largely absent. As Hobson has clearly noted, cultural nationalism was much later in development in the history of nationalism we could in fact consider it as a sort of byproduct, a consequence rather than a cause in the formation of nation states. In fact, the earliest writings on the subject of a national culture mainly center on literary studies <coughs> developed with the institutional shaping of the intellectual sphere, including literary societies, universities, and art academies. One of the earliest such texts by the Chilean Jose Victorino La Stadia was precisely presented to the founding center of the Chilean Literary Society of 1842, as a program for what would be, and I quote, an entirely national literature. The early programs for national art began with the identification of a lack, something that is evident in Domingo Faustino Sarmiento or Francisco Lasso's writings, for example, which identify the absence of a sphere of art in the nation state and proposed filling this void as a building block towards the construction of a new era of civilization and progress. This was, of course, largely a cosmopolitan aspiration that inserted Latin American intellectuals in a broader intellectual context. The period between 1870 and 1919 marks a new era in artistic discussion, dominated by the general emergence of cultural nationalism. It is interesting that this phase corresponds almost exactly to a period of transformation of nationalism into an ethno-linguistic program, as described by Hobson. The fact allows us to insert Latin American debates as part of broader, more global processes, that include different facets of Romantic nationalism, such as the Celtic revival in Ireland, the reinvention of the Kalevala in Finland, or the Swedish Renaissance, among so many other civil movements that placed ethno history at the base of the national imagination. Such a context can be very productive, for as we attend to nationalist claims of exceptionalism and particularity, we tend to forget that national, nationalism itself is part of an international phenomenon. We have as yet not inserted such debates clearly in this greater history. Our selection modestly attempts to at least point to this situation through the inclusion of some few texts. For example, one by Miguel de Namuno, the Spaniard, Miguel de Namuno, on Argentinian writer Ricardo Rojas. Even if this single text cannot adequately express the complex international networks and intellectual exchanges that establish the discourses of nationalism, it at least points to the shared ideals in the Hispanic world. Our survey allows us to distinguish clearly an even movement across the region for the establishment of, establishment of a national art in the first quarter of the century in a movement that placed artists and critics at the service of the nation as builders of a public sphere for art through the institutions of the modern state. The conscience of their foundational roles is present in the writings of figures like Eduardo Schiaffino in Argentina, Teofre Castillo in Peru, or Manuel Gabino in Mexico, to name but a few. The clear consul consolidation of such efforts after the First World War establishes the foundations <coughs> of an era of aesthetic debates that again coincides perfectly with the period between 1918 and 1950, which Bob Hobsbawm, again, identifies with what, is, what he calls the apogee of nationalism. And in the same period, the idea of the nation will be a major factor in framing the discourses of both international modernism and communist internationalism. Yet we must also attend to the nuances of a properly aesthetic debates, which are framed by these general tendencies. As we have already mentioned, the post-war period will insert national, nationalist artistic debates in the larger disputes of Cold War politics. An internationalist impulse will then buy against what Marta Trava called an art of resistance, of local affirmation against the tendencies of North American and European influence. Yet this will be the swan song of nationalist affirmation and artistic debates. An emblematic take of late 20th century positions against nationalist demands is, of course, Elio Tisica's statement at the 1970 information show at MoMA, which is included in our anthology. I quote, I am not here representing Brazil, or Tisica wrote, or representing anything 
to survive Brazil. Exportation and the takeover of a universal face that can be the possible Brazil, a country that simply does not exist. It is interesting that this rejection of nationalist demands come from, comes from an artist like Oti Oitisica, deeply committed both to an international artistic project and to a local politics. The flourishing of multiculturalism and other variants of identity politics in the late 20th century will also be largely defined in opposition to the nation state or on its margins. The discourses of affirmation of Latino artists in the United States is a telling example of the complexities of forging an identity politics in the aftermath of the idea of the nation. The two final sections of the anthology, imagined and displaced communities and new world borders, neo and post-nationalism, speak of new questionings and the always partial revival of aspects pertaining to the idea of the nation. For it is a fact, as I have attempted to suggest here today, that even if over the last few decades the idea of the nation has seemed largely absent from artistic debates in explicit form, it remains to this day a major force underlying our work as academics or curators. This is why the recuperation of these ideas is so important today and why describing the broad tendencies of major trends in 20th century artistic debate is not merely a pedagogic enterprise. An anthology like the one we are compiling has the obvious pitfalls of any ambitious undertaking, as it is attempting to cover, in fact, such an intense long century over such a vast geography. Forced by a project to look into texts produced across the region over a century's time has given us an opportunity to rethink the broader picture. Yet in the final account, even if it seems we can be only be moved to think the region in such terms from without, it is also important to take into account that such general narratives are being built upon the work of national historiographies and on the long history of a charged and complex set of terms. Thank you. <laughs>